Okay, Zia Sama, Ekam, this lecture is about project budgeting. So we're going to spend a little bit of time understanding the basics of budgeting, and then there's a couple of exercises. So I'll make uh, other videos of those for you um, uh, in the given few days and share them with you as well, right? So project budgeting uh, is a successor of the project time management activities. Uh, if you have watched the video so far, Time management has been concerned about figuring out the duration of the project. So we use the critical path method, uh, and then we've uh, actually did the network analysis to find the critical paths, and also then uh, we place the same concepts on top of the Gantt chart to get an idea of the working days of the project as opposed to the um, uh, actual duration of the project. So the actual duration is a bit shorter, uh, the Gantt chart duration is a bit longer because it uh, actually also introduces um, well, holidays and other type of breaks, et cetera, that you may have in your schedule. Uh, so after the time management activities are finished, the next step is then to figure out the budget of the project. Um, and the idea is to somehow come up with um, a budgetary figure, which would uh, tell us how much money uh, is going to be allocated for the project and how much that project should cost. And once the budget has been defined, it becomes a baseline for us. Uh, and then we can measure our performance against that budget to see how uh, well we are spending the money that we have planned to spend, right? So there could be a couple of cases occurring, which is that uh, if the plan was to spend $100 and we spent $100, so in that case, we are going well with the, the budget uh, idea and we're in alignment with it. So there's no gaps between the plan and the reality. Uh, it may also be the case that the plan is to spend $100 uh, and we may end up spending a bit more than 100 because some unforeseeable circumstances occurred such as the cost of uh, the products or the services went up. So in that case, we are um, sort of ahead of the budget. That is to say that there's a budgetary overrun. And it may also be the case that the plan is to spend $100, but we end up spending a little bit less than that. Uh, but that may not necessarily be a bad thing. It could be that we achieved some economies of scale, um, in which case we were able to acquire certain goods or services at a cheaper rate. Uh, or it may be a bad thing in the sense that we ended up doing actually less work than what we had planned to do, which would be a definite no-no for us, right? So we want to uh, come up with a budget and then we want to use that budget as a uh, baseline for ourselves and we'll be collecting data uh, in, in real life when the project is being executed as far as the spending is concerned and we're then going to be evaluating that information against the budget that has been defined. Now, uh, the objective of this lecture are one, to learn about the utility of the budget process. Uh, what is it? Why do we do it? And what benefit do we get out of it? Uh, the second objective is to learn about the particular nuances of the budgeting process. Uh, so what are some of the ways through which this budgetary process actually functions and how does it work, right? And uh, thirdly is to learn about some of the issues in the budgeting process. So we'll uh, be quite brief in this lecture on uh, about these three objectives, right? Now, what is the budget? So it's basically a planning activity, meaning that it happens during the planning phase of the project. Uh, and it's, it's a way of allocating uh, resources, machine resources, human resources, and capital resources to different types of project activities that we have to perform so that those project activities could uh, be performed and their performance could incur uh, a particular cash layout. So we should have money available in order to do those things. So in order to do those activities, we're going to be requiring resources, so we should have money for Right? So this is the budgetary process. Um, what it does is it uh, aligns basically the project spending to the aims of the organization as well. So this is a purpose that it serves, but it serves it um, not explicitly, but implicitly, right? And, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge burden, so to speak, right? The burden is that um, the organization has certain policies, uh, and th these policies have to have to be upheld by the project when it's going into the execution phase. Right? 
So the example that I have here is, for example, the NASA, uh, which had a policy of limiting the cost of its activities. Right? For, as an example, in 1976, the Viking Mars lander was sent out, and the total cost of this budget was around three billion U.S. dollars in 1997. Right? Uh, sorry, in 1976. So later on, what happened was that NASA decided that it wants to limit its cost of, of doing these uh, exploratory activities that it does in, in space. So that becomes then important for the project because when the project's budget is being uh, made up or created, we have to make sure that we uphold the policy that the organization has set up. Right? So what happened as a result of this policy of limiting the cost by NASA was that in 1997, the Pathfinder rover mission went up and the total cost of that was $175 million um, as opposed to the $3 billion that was spent in uh, 1976. So it becomes important for us to consider what the organizational policy is when we are making the budget of the project. So making the budget of the process uh, of the project uh, has to be uh, we have to ensure that it's align in alignment with the policy of the organization, right? So this was a 94% reduction in cost. Then other governments have also sort of followed suit with this idea. Uh, for example, recently India sent uh, an exploration uh, type of uh, activity with, with Mars and they limited their costs as well and they were able to accomplish that in, in a significantly lower cost as opposed to NASA and now NASA is thinking about utilizing the Indian know-how uh, in order to curtail their costs even further. Right? Um, once uh, a budget has been made, um, as I said, it's, it's a planning activity, but as soon as it's, it's created and the execution of the project begins, it becomes a a monitoring tool for upper management. And monitoring requires that we collect the data uh, against the activities that are being performed, and that data has to be then uh, analyzed, uh, and thereby it gives rise to the evaluation uh, concern as well. And then uh, once the evaluation is done, uh, it gives rise to a third concern, which is that of control. Right? So if we have evaluated something, and as I said before, uh, let's suppose the plan is to spend $100 and we spent $100, right? So how do we know this? So we, we will get to know this through monitoring. We'll get to know further about the monitoring data through evaluation. And only then do we get to know that the plan was to spend 100 and we actually spent 100. So is there then a need to exercise any control? So surely there is no control that's necessary because the plan is in alignment with the reality. But on the other hand, control mechanisms do pop up in, in case we are overspending or underspending. So in that case, then uh, control has to be exercised appropriately. Right? Uh, and this does require that proper data be collected at all times. And uh, furthermore, there has to be then uh, reporting of that uh, work uh, by, by the people doing the work in order for that data to be generated so that it could be evaluated and then monitoring could be exercised. Right? Now, the methods of budgeting is, is a concern for us next, and I'll, I'll shortly be discussing uh, two key methods with, us, uh, with, with you guys. But um, what is the formal definition of, of budgeting? Right. So it's a process of forecasting. Right? So budgeting is, is going to foresee the future and is going to decide how much expense that we're going to incur based upon the resources that are going to be required or uh, perceived to be required, right? And these uh, the resources could be in the form of the quantities of uh, material needed or it could be in the number of, uh, you know, manpower hours needed or in the sense of machines being uh, utilized, right? Uh, here's an example table about certain resources and the column named resource names, such as script writer, producer, client, secretary, editor, production staff, editing staff, editing room, etc. So clearly this is some sort of a movie or a documentary being made. Uh, then the maximum uh, units of these required, so we require one script writer, one producer, uh, 0.2 client, one secretary, etc. The standard rate of paying those person is also going to be uh, 
a concern here. So the standard rate is, for example, $75 an hour for the script writer, $100 an hour for the producer and so forth. Um, and then uh, the maximum rate that we're willing to pay. So we're, we're not providing a singular figure here, rather we're providing the range, right? What would be the standard rate? What would be the overt rate? Uh, we, we can't actually know until we go out into the marketplace and acquire these goods and services. So we're not very precise in the budgetary, budgetary process, rather we're making estimation um, an estimation requires that we've got a range of that, right? Um, and prorated means that we're going to be um, sort of expensing these things out uh, slowly and gradually as we use them, right? So if we require a script writer and we require one person. So how many hours is that person going to work? And uh, we can distribute that across some sort of a timetable, right? So that's the budget process. So once we have such figures available, then we can go on to uh, sort of uh, take a stab at, at uh, budgeting the resources. So for example, uh, the project approval is a task, so that requires absolutely zero hours of work, and it will cost us zero amount of dollars, and it's a zero duration activity. The script writing is one person, but we require 102, uh, sorry, 112 hours of work. So we multiply that by the hourly wage rate and we come up with an estimate that it would cost us $8,400 and that 112 hours would be needed to be completed in 14 days, right? Uh, then we can take uh, uh, scheduled shoots and that's 240 hours. So multiply that by some sort of an hourly rate. So that comes out as 5,400 and that will be done in 15 days or so. Right, so this is sort of the idea that we have of going about and building the uh, budget. Now, who should be used in order to make this budget? So we're, of course, we're go not going to rely on people that have absolutely no know-how about the nature of the work that has to be, uh, has to be done. So we're going to rely upon experts, and these are going to be the people who actually perform the work Right, so these are the people that will give us an idea of how much uh, they are going to uh, require in man hours to perform that work, or how much machinery is going to be needed, or how much material resources are going to be required. Right, so we normally employ the experts that actually perform the work for us, and we ask these experts to help us to forecast and come up with estimates of the resources that we have to use. Um, and the thought is, uh, or, or more so than a thought, experience shows us and research shows us that these experts are, are quite good at providing such estimates and their estimates uh, have an error associated with them, but that error is uh, very, very small. So for example, if we ask a bricklayer, how many bricks do we require to build a, a, a wall of a certain dimension? So the estimate that a bricklayer would provide us is going to be um, having a small error, and that error is about one to 2%. So that's quite amazing uh, in the sense that it's, it's quite cheap to get an estimate, and that estimate is fairly accurate. So as opposed to employing that expert, we can deploy other techniques as well, but those other techniques are going to be time consuming, they're going to uh, require a further expense. So the better thing to do when creating a budget is to ask the people performing the work for you to give you the estimates, right? So for ex example, uh, the cost of a house could be calculated by multiplying the square foot covered area with uh, some sort of a currency amount and then adjusting it for unusual factors. Right? Um, what do we mean by this? Well, what I'm trying to get to here is this idea of a heuristic or a rule of thumb, right? which is based upon industry knowledge and our own experiences in the field. So for example, in uh, the city of Peshawar, we know that if we take um, a, a map of a house that needs to be constructed, we could take that uh, covered square foot area 
and multiply it by, let's suppose, 1,800 rupees per square foot. And that would give us an idea of a typical house, uh, the cost of building that house in a typical manner, right? Now we can adjust that for unusual factors in the sense that the person building that house may be deciding to use uh, more expensive tiles or they may be deciding to use furnishings that are more expensive. So we can add that idea to that 1800 and get a fairly accurate estimate of the house. So where do we get the heuristic from? Of course, we get that from the persons building uh, these things or doing these activities on a consistently um, routine basis, right? Um, a further example could be that we could calculate the cost of a, of a shopping plaza, a commercial construction, and for that we can take the square foot covered area and multiply it by 4,000, and that would give us a very decent estimate of how much that plaza would cost us to build. Right? And we experience this consistently, right? If we were to take that map to some sort of a contractor and say, well, uh, here you go, here's a, here's a house that I need to build, how much will it cost me? You'll never see that contractor sitting down for hours and hours trying to guess at how much that house construction is going to cost, rather it's going to take him maybe at most half an hour or something of that nature. And the reason for that is because he's an expert in it, he's done it again and again and again, and that person has a heuristic available and it's simply a matter of multiplying that, right? We see also this heuristic in uh, different appliances as well. For example, if I were to ask you uh, the cost of a 30 inch TV, right? So there was a time when one inch of a TV, a diagonal inch of a TV would cost us a thousand rupees. So if we wanted to buy a 30 inch TV, multiply that by 30, um, uh, 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 sorry, multiply that by a thousand. So 30 multiplied by a thousand is 30,000. So fair enough, that TV would cost us 30,000, right? So we have different heuristics that are uh, available to us. And uh, the more we are aware about them, uh, the more the experts are aware about them, the more easier it is for us to come up with a budget. Uh, Sometimes it is difficult to come up with estimates as there is no tradition uh, to guide the expenses, meaning that these heuristics are absent. We are in a condition where we're doing something that has never been done before. So in that case, then uh, we will have a difficult time coming up with a uh, overall heuristic. So some other process has to be then deployed in order to come up with an idea. Um, so that's going to make our budgetary process a little bit difficult for us, right? Um, forecasting multi-year projects is uh, a bit more trickier than forecasting shorter projects. Uh, and the reason is because the prices of uh, goods is variable, uh, the prices of labor is variable, and exchange rate is unpredictable. So because of that, multi-year projects tend to have more difficulty in the budgetary uh, exercises as opposed to uh, shorter projects, right? Um, then we have to also take into consideration this idea of uh, rates and these rates of, you know, the expense that we have to make. These rates uh, vary and uh, we could have variable rates and we could also have flat rates, right? For example, uh, flat rates would be um, facility charges. Uh, it would be the cost of using a building. So you, you make a contract with somebody and then you have the building. So whether you do any work or you don't do any work, that building is going to be expensed by a certain uh, rate. It does not change. You could take that uh, monthly rent of the building and divide it by 30, and then you could have the per day rate and it will remain flat, whether you use it or you don't use it, right? You still have to pay that. So that's the idea of a flat rate. And then we've got variable rates, and variable rates would be that, well, if you're having me do some work, uh, let's suppose uh, I'm working up to 40 hours, and you're having me do some work within that 40 hours, uh, and let's say my rate is uh, $18, uh, uh, right? Or, well, let's take a easier figure. My rate is $20, right? So my rate will remain flat until 40 hours, so any amount of work, if you 
make me do 20 hours, I'll, I'll charge you 20 multiply by 20. If you have me do 40 hours, I'll charge you 40 hours multiply by 20, right? That's how much you need to pay me. But the moment I do more, let's suppose I do 41 hours, so 42 hours, then you can't pay me that $20. You have to pay me more. You have to pay me that $20 plus half of that $20. You have to pay, pay me $30 in that case, right? Because I'm charging you overtime in that case. So there's a variability in certain rates, right? Um, in other things, this variability is, uh, it goes in another direction. For example, if I buy one item uh, of product X, so it will cost me $100. Uh, but if I buy a thousand items of item X, then the cost is going to go down because I'm going to be achieving economies of scale, right? So in that case, there's a variability. Then we have this idea of cash flows. And cash flow is basically the amount of money that we are expensing out, right? Uh, when we do work, we're paying for it. So that's the cash outlay or that's the cash out, uh, outflow. The idea is that the accounting systems that we have in organizations are uh, very linear in their thinking, whereas project expenses are not quite linear, right? So when we're thinking about cash flows, we have to make sure that we sort of uh, have this mentality of the accountants in our uh, head as well, and we, we have a fairly good understanding of how the accounting processes in our organization works, because if we don't, we're going to end up in problems. Here's an example of what I mean. If you have a budget of uh, $8,000 for an activity, and you plan that you're going to spend 20000 uh, sorry, $2,000 per month as an expense uh, for four months, right? So uh, every four months, you're going to expense out 20, uh, sorry, 2,000. I don't know why I keep saying 20,000. You keep uh, expenses, expensing out to $2,000, right? So fair enough. In four months time, you'll consume that $8,000. But what happens in a project is that this linearity gets violated, right? more work happens at the beginning of the project, more expenses happen at the beginning of the project. And once we get the project going on, the expenses go down because uh, you know we have to buy material at the beginning, we have to engage the labor at the beginning more. But as we move forward, uh, the expenses could go down for us. So let's suppose in this case, our expenses happen in this form, that we spend 5,000 in the first month and 1,000 in subsequent months uh, for three months so uh, again we're spending the eight thousand in four months but the the nature of our cash flow has changed right so from a project's perspective this is not going to create a problem but you will definitely have the accounting department breathing down your neck because they will consider the expenses that you have made as unanticipated and unacceptable to them and that is going to create problems Right. So you need to understand how you expense out your uh, money uh, once you have defined the budget for it and you have to get a fairly good idea of your uh, existing accounting uh, process. Now we've got two uh, key budgeting techniques. One is called the top-down approach and the other is called the bottom-up approach. We've already talked a little bit about the top down approach in the sense of the heuristic idea that I discussed with you uh, a little while ago. Um, so we'll uh, quickly go through the top down and the bottom up approaches next, right? So what is the top down approach? The top down approach is based on collective judgments and experiences of top and middle managers concerning uh, similar past projects. Um, so we do things, we learn from them, and that becomes a part of our cumulative memory as an organizational member. So when new ideas come in front of us or new projects come in front of us, we will use those previously held uh, concepts that we have in our mind to come up with a budget we estimate of the next new concept that we're trying to implement. So that's the idea of the heuristic, that's the idea of that parametric cost that we have available to us because of our past experience. So parametric cost, the, the idea I give you about the TV and the price of the uh, per inch of the TV is the idea of the parametric cost, right? So 
projects uh, in this top-down approach are estimated at the overall project level right so we're not going to bother about breaking that project into smaller pieces and then think about how much these individual pieces are going to cost rather we are staying at the overall level the estimate is then used at the lower levels to split up the budget amongst the tasks so we say well here's the project and we estimate the overall cost of building this house to be 60 lakh rupee so how much of that 60 lakh will go to bricks how much of that 60 lakh will go towards uh, cement towards sand towards labor towards woodwork tiles sanitary electrical wiring etc so we take that 60 lakh amount and then we uh, sort of split it at the smaller uh, level right so this is how the top down approach works the advantage is that it's uh, fairly cheap to do fairly quick to do and it's quite accurate and it handles uh, the substantial amount of errors that we may have so we may say that out of that 60 lakh rupees you know we estimate that you know 10 lakh will go towards the bricks but we end up spending a little bit more or a little bit less that's fairly okay with uh, with this top down approach it does not create any big disadvantages for us and if un some unforeseeable type of occurrences happen such as that oh we realize that there's a big rock that we have to break down so that's going to cost us uh, 10,000 rupees extra. Uh, that's not really going to uh, create much of a havoc with this project. Uh, it's, it's fairly easy to introduce um, these uh, small activities or tasks that we had not planned for before. Uh, so we can sort of say that it deals with exceptions quite well, right? And uh, it doesn't create any serious budgetary problems for us. As opposed to the top down budgeting, about bottom-up budgeting right so this is going to be something that we're going to use not in normal routine cases but rather projects for which we don't have many heuristics or projects in which we don't have any uh, know-how or projects that are fairly unique in their uh, mannerisms or, or uh, projects where we use the top-down budgeting idea what happens in top-down budgeting is that we have to rely on the concept of the work breakdown structure, and this is what that we learned in project scope management, where we divided the project into smaller pieces, and there, there were two key pieces there. One were uh, taking the overall project and dividing it into smaller deliverables. Uh, it was a product level division, and the second division was that those uh, product level divisions become assignable as pieces of work to individuals or groups of individuals. So we break it down to the level of the work packages. So WBS in this case is the work breakdown structure and WP in this case is the work package uh, idea. So the WBS um, is the breakdown of first the product into smaller products and then that becomes assignable. So these become work packages where then we start considering about the cost of labor and the cost of material. And we add from the bottom uh, of this WBS that has been decomposed and we add up all these costs towards the top. And then we come up with a overall concept of the budget of that project, right? So what happens in uh, bottom-up estimation is that uh, we get fairly more accurate uh, estimates coming at us but uh, there is this risk that we may overlook certain activities and we may not plan for them and if those pop up later on then this uh, budgetary technique has a certain difficulty in, in managing those unexpected uh, expenses or those unexpected uh, costs that we uh, incur during the course of our business as opposed to the top-down estimation right um, the beauty of this technique is that because the people that have to perform the work will be sitting down and coming up with the budget, so there's more ownership of the budget and there's more um, buy-in because it's been created using a more participatory approach, right? Um, uh, but however, uh, it's a very rare occurrence that organizations use bottom-up estimation. Uh, more frequently, it's been found that organizations tend to opt for the top-down estimation as opposed to the bottom-up budgeting. Right? 
Uh, then we've got this thought of work element costing, and this is something that we'll encounter in uh, basically the uh, bottom-up estimation. So what happens here is, as an example, uh, we've got the cost of labor, and let's suppose it's $10 an hour. Then we uh, perceive that we'll require that labor for 16 hours, uh, and that we'll be requiring some material as well. So that's $235, right? So it's a $10 per hour, 16 hours, and we require 235 for material costs, right? Um, but we also have to think about organizational overheads, such as utilities, indirect labor, uh, the use of uh, other departments and their services, et cetera. And let's suppose this indirect uh, costs are being expensed out by this organization at the rate of 50% of direct labor. So 16 times 10, 16 hours times $10 an hour, multiply by 50% uh, of direct labor, so multiply that by 1.5, plus the 235 for the material, so that's going to cost us $475 to perform that activity. So this is the idea of work element costing. Right? Um, in some organizations, uh, uh, the uh, project manager adds this overhead, uh, and these organizations expect that the budgetary figures being provided to the accounts department and finance departments include this overhead, um, whereas in other organizations, the uh, accounting department adds this overhead themselves, so the project manager doesn't have to do this. Right? Um, activity-based costing is another way of going about doing things, and an activity-based costing uh, charge uh, overhead uh, is, is charged against cost drivers uh, such as machine time, weight of raw material, uh, or total time of completion of the project. So it, it all depends on what uh, way of uh, costing is being used or what techniques are being uh, utilized. Right? Uh, direct resource costs are charged to the project without an overhead uh, added on. So for example, if we're using machinery or materials, so there's no managerial overhead being added on. Um, machinery from outside of the organization is charged as per actual. So if we're bringing in an excavator from the outside and that excavator is going to charge us 2,800 rupees per hour. So there's no overhead for that. We simply uh, expense it out as 2,800 uh, rupees per hour for the number of hours that we're using. Uh, machinery that we borrow from within the organization, uh, it has to incur some sort of an overhead uh, for using it. And we also have to uh, introduce this idea of depreciation into our budget as well. Uh, additional add-on includes the use of uh, general sales and administrative uh, expenses. So that's an added expense, GS and A costs. Uh, and that could include the cost of using senior management, the cost of uh, functional staff such as accountants and marketing and R&D and sales, et cetera. So any expense incurred in that sense has to be um, introduced into the budget as well. And that's called the GS and A expense. Um, and the organizational members uh, would either, uh, the, the policy of the organization would dictate how that's going to be introduced into the budget. So either you will do it as a project manager at the GS and A expense or either the accounting department will add that one to you, uh, to, to the budget for you, right? Um, so the final budgetary cost of the project is going to include the direct cost, the indirect cost, the overhead charges, and the GS and A charges. Um, and the GSA and A charges are uh, something that, that uh, plays havoc in the project when projects are uh, delayed because then we require the support of uh, the rest of the organization. So that expense will add on and it will be uh, contributing to further violation of the uh, project's budget in cases where the projects are actually delayed, right? Uh, so they, they, uh, they, they, they cre create a bit of a, a problem. Now, budgetary cuts um, do happen. The government does it, the organization does it. So that definitely is going to play a contributing role 
able towards the project, uh, not only in limiting the expenses that it can have, it's going to damage the quality of the project, it's going to cause uh, delays as well because you won't be able to make payments and because you're not making payments, people will stop doing work for you. So it will, um, any type of a budget we cut is actually going to uh, hinder the project further and make it more late. Now, how do we uh, improve the budgetary process? Well, we should use um, our previous learnings that we have and if we've got certain templates or uh, forms available to us or, uh, you know, what, what I mean by this is that if we can uh, look into the books of previous projects, then we have basically forms and templates. So if we have done projects before, we should be searching out that uh, information and, and using it. Right? Uh, secondly, we need to understand our position in the learning uh, curve, right? So what do we mean by the learning curve? It's a very funky idea. The idea is that the first time that we do something, uh, we create more wastage and we take more time to do it. Therefore, it will cost more. But the more we do something again and again and again, the more better we become at it, and thereby we end up using less resources, fewer resources, and we spend less time in doing that particular activity. So as an example, if you ask me to make a dinner for you today, and let's suppose I don't know how to cook, even though I, don't, I do know how to cook, I'm quite good at it, but if you were to assume that I don't know how to cook, and you ask me to create, uh, cook dinner, it will take longer and you'll find that I will be creating more wastage of resources because it's the first time that I'm doing it. Right? But if I were a chef and you were to ask me to make dinner, I will create less wastage and I'll be able to do it more fluidly and more quickly only because I am doing it over and over again and I'm quite good at it, right? So in the first case where I'm uh, a novice, in that case, I'm sort of behind on the learning curve. But in the second case where I'm an expert, I'm far ahead on the learning curve, right? So what that means is that the more that, uh, you know, somebody has done something, the more cheaper that person is going to be for you because they will be creating less mess, uh, less expenses, and they'll be able to use uh, fewer resources to do it, right? So we need to learn where we are in, in our organization, where our team is on the learning curve, so that we can come up with a fairly good idea of what we have. So there's a fancy equation for it, Tn is the time required to complete the nth unit of uh, something, T1 is the time required to complete first unit, so uh, you create the first unit, you note down the time required to do it. Uh, N raised to the power R uh, is the next term, that's the multiplier, so R is the exponent of the learning curve, and it is calculated as the log of the learning rate divided by log 2, so that will uh, tell us basically our uh, position in the learning curve and we'll get an idea of how much time it will require us to create the next item, right? So these are different ways that can be used and I'm sure if you're interested in the learning curve idea, you look it up on Google, you'll find a lot of examples for it as well. Uh, we're not going to be doing any exercises on the learning curve, we'll just keep it as an idea in our, our head uh, for right now, right? Um, and uh, we're coming towards the end now. We've got this idea of tracking signals. So I'll just sort of briefly give you an, um, the concept of it and then I'll create an exercise on this so that you can actually use this concept and deploy it. Right? Um, for tracking signals, we have to understand that there are errors taking place in the estimates that we're uh, making. And these errors are because of uh, two they, they fall into two major types. One is called the random error and the other is called the bias error. We're not very much concerned about random errors because uh, if we add all the random errors up, they add up to zero. 
So in that case, the random errors have absolutely no effect upon our, the project at all. So they are not a consideration for us at all. But bias errors do contribute significantly uh, and they, they have an ill effect upon the budget that we have. Right? Bias error means that we um, sort of uh, think, you know, that we're quite good at something uh, and we uh, overestimate our own capabilities and say, oh, we can do this in, in three days time. But when we actually come to doing it, we find that, oh, it took longer than three days, right? So in that, in that case, we had a bias and that additional amount of time required to do uh, that work has not been taken into consideration. So that creates an uh, error and somehow we need to uh, curtail for that error. We need to handle that error, right? So for that, we use the idea of tracking signals. Um, the concept is that we uh, calculate the track, tracking signal and it can help us to uh, sort of unravel the systematic bias and the cost and other estimates. Uh, and it can give us an idea of whether it's a positive bias or a negative bias. And once we have a grasp of it, then we can uh, lay down control mechanisms for it, right? And lastly, there are uh, other factors and effect as well. Uh, for example, research indicates that between 60 and 85% of projects fail to meet their time period, they fail to meet their cost baseline and other performance objectives. Other research tells us that uh, the situation is even worse in information technology projects. Uh, there's more failure rates present there as far as time, cost, and other performance indicators are concerned. And um, the one research showed us in 1994 that there were about 45 estimating models available for information uh, technology type of projects, but none of them were being utilized by anybody. So there's a huge uh, concern in information technology projects, right? And uh, other factors yet that contribute towards uh, making our project budgets uh, difficult are basically the variability in uh, resource prices, uh, not adding for allowances for increased personnel, not taking into consideration training costs, uh, and th this comes from this uh, book called The Mythical Man Month by Brooks. It's a very interesting book, so if you ever get a chance to read it, uh, there's optimistic bias, which makes our uh, project budgets a little bit difficult. Uh, the organizational climate makes it difficult, right? The, the, uh, you know, budgetary cuts make it difficult. Uh, the probabilistic factors and and taking long probabilities of things make our budgets problematic. Uh, just simple bad luck creates uh, issues for us. And uh, lastly, uh, poor estimates also uh, make budgets difficult to do, right? So I'll stop this lecture now. This was just a, a brief idea of the budgeting process. Um, and next, we'll, uh, I'll create a, a little bit of an exercise on uh, basically the idea of tracking signals so that we can actually implement this, right? So thank you very much.